Thank you. I've been um, asked to talk to you a little bit about inbreeding, and um, they wanted to make the title a bit more exciting, so they called it Uncomfortable Family Trees. Um, <laughs> so I went and picked out this picture of a tree. You probably, some of you at least will recognise it, so it's that Wanaka tree. But it's got a farming background because it started as a fence post. That the tree wasn't dead, and so it um, grew into this unusually shaped tree. Um, Anyway, so inbreeding. What, what's inbreeding? So it's when an individual has um, at least one paternal and maternal ancestor that's in common. Um, so here's a, an example where the parents um, are first cousins, and so they've got common ancestry. Um, so the, the cousins have a, um, grandparents that are in common. Um, but the way you, if you draw one of these diagrams, the way you can sort of see it is if you start from the individual and trace around through the... Um, the maternal line to some common ancestor and then back down through the paternal line you get back to the individual. So you can create one of these loops in this pedigree. Um, so a bit more of a technical definition so, um, and, and to try and quantify the amount of inbreeding. So the technical definition I've given here is the probability that two alleles at a locus are identical by descent. So if you think about starting at a position in the genome and there's a particular allele at that spot. You can work out the probability that comes down <laughs> through, each, um, uh, through each progeny in that line and down through the other side and at the, the same allele ends up in the same individual. So that's, the, that's called being identical by descent and then we can use the pedigree information to calculate those probabilities. <clears throat> so for example, if parents are full sibs, then the offspring is um, inbreeding of 0.25. If they're half sibs, then it's half that. If the parents are cousins, then it's half that again. Right, so that was using pedigrees, but with genomics we can start um, tracking stuff, not having to use probability so much, but um, look to see what, what actually has happened or how much of the genome is actually similar. So with um, genomics, we talk about the, the proportion of the genome that's identical by descent. And we can start getting um, a handle on that by using you know, these genomic technologies such as SNP chips or sequencing. <coughs> um, there are different ways of estimating that and they give slightly different answers, but, but they're essentially the same sort of numbers. So here's an example um, from an Irish study where they've got um, some genomic estimates and they've got the pedigree estimates. And you'll see that there's a bit of a relationship there, but there's also quite a bit of scatter. So, so what, you know, why are those different? And there's three reasons I've given here. So the first is depth of pedigree. If, if you don't have a very deep pedigree, um, then you're going to miss out knowing what's, what the ancestors are further back. And so there might be some common ancestors there you've missed. Um, and so that means that the, the genomics will, will actually capture that because it can sort of figure that out. Um, and so you get higher genomic inbreeding than, than from that pedigree, so you get these values that sit up in here. Um, so you might have pedigree errors. In that case, you might, the genomics might be telling you it's higher or it might be telling you it's lower. Here's an example where the, the pedigree said um, the inbreeding should be about 0.25, but the genomics are saying that it should be about 0.05, so it looks to me like the pedigree is wrong in that case. Um, the third reason is Mendelian segregation, and um, Steve gave a good talk about this um, yesterday. So this is, um, for any individual, they don't get exactly a quarter of each of the grandparents' um, genome, so there's variation around that. And uh, um, so using these genomic tools, we can get a handle on, uh, on that and um, yeah, get better estimates of the actual inbreeding. Um, so why do we worry about inbreeding? So the main reason is this, um, this phenomenon called inbreeding depression, and it relates to um, harmful alleles. And if alleles are going to stick around in a population and they're harmful, um, then they have to hide. And so the way they hide is that they're, if they're only expressed in the homozygous form, then if they're in the heterozygous form, then they're hiding. And so you can't normal methods of selection won't act on those and they won't select against them. <clears throat> and so often the harmful alleles in, um, 
in the genomes are, are present in this um, as recessive um, alleles. So here's an example. Um, if, if you've got an allele that's at frequency 0.1 and there's no inbreeding, then you'll see it about 1% of the time in your population just through um, random coming together of, of those two alleles. But if the individual's inbred, then that starts increasing the probability that harmful allele is expressed and more inbreeding the higher it gets. And so that gives rise to this um, inbreeding depression. Right, so here's um, an example from a, a human population. So this is um, the pedigree of Charles II of Spain. Um, you can see from that pedigree that there's quite, quite a few loops. <laughs> Uh, current royal family seems to be uh, avoiding the strategy, I would say. <laughs> um, but you can see what happened here with the title of this paper. So um, essentially that line came to an end. Um, so here's, here's Charles II. He lived to about 40 years old. Um, if you calculate his inbreeding using those methods and using that pedigree, it was about 0.254. Um, and, and some of that was coming from the fact that his mother was his father's niece and his grandmother was also an aunt. Um, I've, I've given a summary of, of what I've seen um, there, that he had physical and mental disabilities, but if you want to get some more details, it's quite fun to go into Wikipedia and um, they're quite colourful explanations of what it got. I think the historians went to town a little bit. but. Um, <laughs> um, and you can also see um, he actually had quite a big tongue, so he had trouble speaking. Um, and, and those breeders of you with a keen eye would notice he's got a rather overshot jaw, and so you would have culled him straight away, wouldn't you? <laughs> Never mind, they didn't cull him. He lived to about 40. He married twice, but didn't, didn't have any children. So um, presumably a result of his inbreeding. Um, so that was just one little example, a um, bit of fun, but um, it gives an illustration of what can happen. But here I've got um, some results of some more, um, more relevant studies to us in livestock and, and more general studies using lots of individuals. And this Leroy paper has um, summarised it, so trait values decrease by about 1.5% um, per 10% per of inbreeding. And then more recent studies have started looking at the, using genomic estimates of inbreeding to do those relationships, and they're finding stronger results um, because you're getting more accurate um, estimates of the inbreeding. So I've given here two strategies to avoid inbreeding. So the first one is a reasonably simple strategy. You've, if you've selected the parents for the next generation, then you, then you just avoid mating close relatives by looking at the relatedness between um, you know, your sets of sires and, and dams. Um, the, the issue with that is once you've got that set of parents selected, you've lost control over what happens in the long term. You've kind of set um, the amount of inbreeding that's going to happen. You can't control it. And so strategy two tries to, to balance that a bit more. So you want to, and to do that, you have to balance, there's a trade-off um, between your genetic gain and your genetic diversity. So you give up some genetic gain, um, but you increase your genetic diversity. So if you think of a, a list of sires, for example, so instead of having a cut off and pull, picking all the ones above that, some of these ones down towards the bottom of that list might be related already, so you, you throw those out and you pick one further down the list. So you're giving up genetic gain, but you're getting more diversity. Um, so there's, there's a lot of theory around that called optimal contributions selection. Um, it, it's really the underlying basis of things like Animate, um, which some people here use. Um, and there's other, other selection programs in different parts of the world. Um, and as I said, yeah, the aim is to really to control what happens in the long term. Um, but you can also control what happens immediately once you've got that list of, of parents. You can start then still designing matings to control um, inbreeding in the progeny. The reason it's become important to constrain relatedness really, really ramped up when people started using pedigree-based selection. So things like BLUP meant that your, your top animals 
um, that you select tend to be more related than as if you just went out and, and picked the, um, you know, the, the top ones on their own phenotypes. Um, so, so with that, um, we, we need to start considering um, constraint relatedness. In the same way, once you start using genomic selection, the top animals on the list are going to be more similar um, genomically, and therefore we need to use those genomic relationships to try and control um, yeah, the amount of inbreeding that's going to occur long term. Um, I should say there's a little bit of discussion in the literature about exactly how that should work, but as a general principle, I think that's um, sensible. Um, so here's an example with the um, progeny test, uh, central progeny test flock from last year, the set of dams and sires that were used. And I've plotted here the relatedness between the dams and the sires. Um, so each little um, block in this plot is a combination of a dam and a sire. And if it's, if it's sort of white or a light colour, then it means it's got low relatedness. And if it's oranges and reds, then it's got high relatedness. Um, and so you can see there's some, there's definitely some matings there that you want to avoid um, um, between some of those sires and dams. Yep. <coughs> um, so I've been talking so far about um, what's happening in, in the breeders' flocks. Um, but if you think about you know, decline in production, then it's really the production sector that's important. And so um, we also pays to think about what might happen in that production sector. Um, so one of the things that does happen, which is a good thing as far as inbreeding is concerned, is that we have these terminal cross um, lines. So um, you know, ram gets mated to a, a ewe of a completely different breed, and so there'll be no inbreeding in that production cross, and it's a terminal cross, so they're all getting slaughtered. Um, and, and they shouldn't be affected by this inbreeding depression. Um, but to do that, we need to maintain you know, maternal lines as well in the industry. And so, you know, if nothing else, then they, they could be affected by inbreeding. So perhaps we need to start considering that. Um, so hopefully a little bit of discussion now about um, you know, what tools um, could, could we give to breeders to help them. Um, so, so what might be useful? And so the, the first cab off the rank would be to have some sort of tool that tells you about inbreeding. So we could provide lists of inbreeding in your flock. Um, it, it tells you what has happened. It sort of hasn't told you how to, you know, if there's a problem there, it's already happened, but at least it's a bit of an audit. Um, would that sort of thing be useful? Would you be able to have a, like to see that? Yeah. See some nods? Um, pro probably more useful is, is to start looking at what matings can be done so you can actually get, get to the inbreeding thing before it happens. Um, so there's different ways this could provide it, be provided. It's really, uh, I mean, the information's there. It's the logistics of how to, to tell the system what you want to know and how to get it back to you. Um, so things like you know, perhaps if you've got a list of your ewes and rams in the system, then, then you know, perhaps could provide back, you know, the, the reds and the oranges, the matings to exclude as, as a list. Um, <coughs> or perhaps the improved tool could have some lookup tables where you punch in a sire and a, and a dam and see what its progeny and breeding would be. Um, um, the next one we've got there is design for multi-sire mating groups. Um, and I, I think tools like Animate do do this, don't they? So, so the idea here is I've, I've tried to ex block out the bad bits and just leave some blocks of combinations where the, where the colour is sort of those lighter colours. Um, I haven't quite done it right. There's a few here that maybe you'd need to move to another block. But, um, just to sort of give the flavour of, of that, because if you've got multi sire mating groups, it's got a bit more complicated than just choosing a pair. Um, and then, yeah, I guess part of the logistics, you know, um, any mate, as I understand, uses pedigree relationships, but it could use genomic relationships. If, but how do we get those into any mate? And, and um, you know, would people want to see both pedigree and genomic? And if not all the animals have been snip chipped, then how do we handle 
the combinations, and it, it's kind of sitting in there for single step anyway, so it could be provided. Um, but I don't know, what, what do people think about what would be useful? Oh, I would not so killing that. The multi-group stuff's a bit more complicated than the individual application. Yeah. So, so when you're doing your peers, it's not too difficult to isolate what side groups can't go to that group, isn't it? Right. But certainly when you're doing this sort of large, so, large scale multi-making groups, it's yeah. a bit more of a headache for to align, I imagine. So you, you're okay handling it currently with what you're doing, is that what you're saying? The, the, the way I am, but if we look to, to all genomics and, and multi-make group stuff, yeah. yeah. Is it not a time-consuming process? I don't know what it is. Do you think we could provide tools that would make it less time-consuming? Uh, I would imagine, but you'd have to invest in infrastructure like auto drafts as well. Sure. Otherwise you're still in the minimum you set up. So. But the animation makes select groups to do training on that. I mean, they'll, they can give you a uh, mating which um, reduce the inbreeding yep. as much as possible. Yep. Um, and, you know, yeah, if you've got a number of views, I think I haven't got time to get my head around all that by myself. Yep. So I'd rather pay someone else to do it. Sure. Yeah. Idea. So is that that's working fine the way it is? There's nothing extra that's needed. I mean, maybe the genetics uh, is one thing. No, it is. No, it seems to seems to work fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because it does give you a reading of what you know what and breeding you had to cure and yep. uh, what you know what you need to do to do it. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, making allocations for people with genomics, but we run it through different code to our standard AnyMate code. But yeah, we'll, we're in the process of migrating the whole system over so that it'll just gobble up either a SNP, set of SNP results for the animals or as a genomic relationship matrix and solve it. So it's a relatively small step from what we've got to add that in. Interesting question as to whether um, you know genomic service providers or um, improve are going to set up competing products. Which interesting question. <laughs> so genomics tells you that um, the grandparents only got a very small proportion of the. Of the um, the genome of the animal does it change the breeding likelihood or Yes. So, so I mean, so we can be able to get that information. Yep. Um, so, so I mean, it's, it's got to got to come from some grandparent, but it's not evenly distributed amongst them. Yeah. And so, if if the inbreeding went through one of those grandparents in particular, then you know, if it was higher or lower than than the 0.25, then that would change it. Yep. So there's an example of how the Irish have, have implemented it. Um, so you can give the, you can put a, a U list onto this um, website. Um, as I understand it, you actually need to type in each sire that you're interested in, and it's, I think, limited to about five sires. Um, so, so maybe it's not, it might not handle the New Zealand breeding flocks as as nicely, um, but it's, it's kind of similar. I guess you get that colour chart similar to what I was showing previously. Um, um, and then the last thing I had was talking about industry flocks again. Um, so what tools could be provided to help help control inbreeding in the in the general industry? Um, I mean, do you keep lists of sires that you sell to? Specific clients, yeah. And so when they come back, do you do you try and manage your next set? And you know, if it was if we had tools that would let you put in who they were and who the next lot could be, you help you select those. Would that be useful? I mean, that is it significant the chance of industry inbreeding? Well, good question. Um, I mean, we we don't really have much of a handle on it. 
Um, I mean, some people that have been through here before thought it might be quite high because uh, using rams for several years and may well be using them across you know, his, own, his own daughters. Ken won't cost to actually use some of our new rams over our TV, the older rams over the older years, yep. as a way of minimising them. Sure. Uh, but perhaps we could, you know, by choosing set ram sets for the next year, you know, help control that even, even more. First thing would be to know how inbred the stuff block is, because they've obviously a fair fairly well inbred and the clients like you to be, yep. and they could be putting half brothers back on half sisters, sure. even doing the two yeah. thing, yep. depending on the length and the variety of silos you're using. Right. I watch it with a client list and I've had to turn clients off a side group. Right. Because they've got a sheep in their head and the bastards went and picked it, even though they only <laughs> probably had about half a dozen choices out of 600, they found <laughs> four of the same sort. Yep. And then I said to this guy, I said, right. no, you can't have that. You've had that same one three years in a row. Yep, great. Uh, yeah. Because some people have a very you know, fixed idea of what sort of sheep they are, and it will be the same sort of soil. Mm -hmm. yeah. Describing the connectedness is more likely to result in the breeding. Um, probably less likely because if, if, if you're a closed flock then, then you've got limited choices um, and if you're connecting this you're probably going to choose. But if you want to get good connectors within your flock you've got to use rams over two or three years. Um, you could use multiple rams in different years but it gets perhaps a bit more complicated. Um, and those I mean, the, like the sire referencing things, those rams might be used in multiple flocks, so it's increasing relatedness. But it, I would expect rams from other flocks to, to help you in breeding, really. Breeding in something from outside of lower your inbreeding, so if you share rams to end that use with other flocks. So your, your link sire across here is yes, you, you know, you yeah. bring that up, but yeah. like your link sire from other flocks will counteract that. So when we work with a client but with any mate and we see somebody's getting the problem, first thing we'll do is make sure they're not selecting their rams from too many sires so that, that they might have to drop a few high ranking rams to move to other sire lines. And then the other thing, that, that'll help a little bit, but then the big helper is to get that outside ram. Uh, and, that, and when you do the allocation, that outside ram tends to mit, uh, mop up all the ewes that are really hard to make because they're highly related to the ones you've got. So the, the outside rams are, you know, are the answer. You could argue, though, the more we pull the whole industry together into one connected mm. uh, thing, that we'll lose genetic diversity. But if, if you look at the Holstein dairy cattle or something, but the, we're, we're a gazillion miles away from how narrow they've become, and we still yeah. drink the milk. Alrighty, I'm just conscious that there is a wind-up down here right. that we need to get to. So, okay. thank you.